Hey, we are live. Now all we have to do is tell people about it. <laughs> this episode of Trifles is brought to you by the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. <laughs> Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, there were men that were dancing, creeping, and crooked, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? What's a tantalus? Or a gasogene? And what's the difference between a handsome cab and a four-wheeler? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 169. Loneliness and Isolation in the Canon. Hello and welcome once again to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast, where we look into some of the minutia in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. And I'm Bert Walder. And we are delighted to be with you here today. We are recording this episode, of course, but we're also broadcasting it live on YouTube and Facebook, our first time ever for trying this. And the reason we're doing this is because it has become apparent that many people are sheltering in place because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And there are cases where people can become quite lonely, isolated, and perhaps even depressed. And we thought we might run this little show just to interrupt your day for a bit and to provide a little entertainment and to keep us all connected. So that's why we are here. If you uh, are listening to this as a recording, you can find the show notes at ihose.co slash trifles169. And of course, you can follow us on social media on YouTube now, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, where we are I Hear of Sherlock. And if you have it in your hearts, if you'd like to help support the show, you can go to our Patreon page, which you can reach off of sherlockholmespodcast.com. Find us on Patreon there and donate. Uh, a, a dollar a month is as little as it costs, or you can give whatever you want. But all of your donations go directly to supporting the show here. We have costs like streaming. We, we've, we've paid for the branding now on, on StreamYard. So you see this neato banner uh, coming up, and it allows us to uh, distribute the show to folks. Uh, so anything that you can give would help. Just go to our homepage, SherlockHolmesPodcast.com and make that donation. Um, we will be taking uh, questions from you. We'll be taking questions and comments in the second half of the show, but Bert and I wanted to kick it off right now by beginning the discussion about who are some of the people in the Sherlock Holmes stories that we come across who happen to be lonely or isolated in some way. And Bert, because I am, I'm in a giving spirit, I thought, well, I'd allow you to start the conversation here. Who are some of the lonely people that we know in the Sherlock Holmes stories, and why are they lonely? Well, that's a terrific question that, for which I don't have a terribly detailed answer. I mean, the, you know, when I think about loneliness in the Sherlock Holmes stories, the first person I think about is Sherlock Holmes, who we will find eventually. This is one of the few things that I looked up earlier. In The Lion's Mane, um, you know, we do have a reference to Holmes in retirement in supposedly his own words. And after a couple of paragraphs where he describes his villa and so on, he says, interestingly enough, he says, my house is lonely. But that's, that's kind of it. I mean, and when you look at what goes on in the lion's mane, you find that there's even in the far reaches of Holmes's retirement, there's no shortage of people popping around the neighborhood and he has his housekeeper. But Holmes is someone who um, 
I don't know. When I think about Holmes, I think he may have had congenital loneliness because he wasn't the easiest person to be around. And so we know how he amuses himself because there are lots of points in the canon where he and Watson are still, we've talked about this, you know, over the last few episodes because of the weather, they're stuck in the house. So he has his chemical table and our pal Chris Zordan has written, I think, about what kind of experiments uh, Holmes might have had. Oh, Bert, can, we get your, can we get your volume up a little bit? Get my Folks volume. are having trouble hearing you. Oh, really? Okay, how's that? Oh, much better. Okay, so Holmes um, has his chemical table, and we know that he does experiments of a uh, wide variety, and Chris Sorden's written about that. He also does things like explore the motets of Lassus. He engages in target practice. He sometimes takes cocaine. He updates his indexes. He reads. You know, we don't know a lot about what he reads, but he's familiar with Horace and Hafiz and Winwood Reed. And music, he, he amuses himself with his violin and on the phonograph and so on. So there's a start, Sherlock Holmes. I, well, I think that's a great start. Um, you know, there's, there's another uh, section, and he's not yet retired yet, in The Adventure of the Mazarin, uh, where, of course, this is that famous uh, narration, that third-party narration. Uh, it was pleasant to Dr. Watson to find himself once more in the untidy room of the first floor of Baker Street, which had been the starting point of so many remarkable adventures. He looked around him at the scientific charts upon the wall, the acid-charred bench of chemicals, the violin case leaning in the corner, the coal scuttle, which contained of old the pipes and tobacco. Finally, his eyes came around to the fresh and smiling face of Billy, the young but very wise and tactful page who had helped fill up the gap of loneliness and isolation which surrounded the Saturnine figure of the great detective. So we remember when Holmes is reminiscing in one of his cases about Watson leaving him for a wife, the only selfish thing that he remembered. Um, this could have very well been the case that Holmes knew. Uh, you know, he told us in A Study in Scarlet that he got into fits of great depression from time to time. So Holmes probably knew that he was subject to this type of loneliness and isolation and did appear to prefer having people around him, if for nothing more than to uh, validate his thoughts, um, to whom he could show off <laughs> in some cases and, and, and uh, use them as an outlet for his uh, intellectual pursuits. Remember, he always said that um, he was, his mind was like a racing engine. If it's not hooked up to the work uh, with which it's supposed to be doing, it will crack itself to pieces. And having a companion there, someone uh, to share his thoughts, to share his uh, intuition with was one way to do that. Absolutely. Although I find it hard to believe that Holmes ever turned to Billy and said, you know, Billy, if this solution terms blue, it means a man's life. <laughs> uh, and Billy would go, Oh, <laughs> I'll get the door, sir. <laughs> Billy would go, you talking to me? <laughs> right. That's great. Uh, um, yeah. Well, that's true. And then there's, and then there's Watson. You know, we know Watson um, describes himself early on as not the most sociable person in the world and finds himself when he comes to London without a friend. And that's why Mike Durda and other people have called the cases of Sherlock Holmes is the story, stories of the world's first consulting detective and his only friend. Mm -hmm. But we know that when Watson has some time on his hands, his hands, he reads yellow back novels and uh, the sea stories of uh, Clark whoever Russell. that writer, yeah, Clark Russell, yeah. and goes and plays billiards with Thurston at least yeah. once. So he's a little bit more sociable. But you know, this whole question about um, loneliness in the canon we, we do see some other evidences of it. I mean, we hadn't talked about this, but when I think of loneliness in the canon, I think about people like Nathan Garadeb. Oh. And Garadeb, you know, and clearly here's somebody who is so in his own circle or in his own um, 
process or whatever's going on with Nathan Garadim, that he rarely gets out of the house, which is one of the reasons why his presence at home becomes an issue. But he has, like many Victorians, you know, this um, um, collection. He's collected, Holmes says, something like old bones and all kinds of stuff, lots of stuff, but um, nothing of particular value, has his little cabinet of curiosities. And that's a characteristic, I think, of, of certainly English society at a certain point. I mean, when you go to Britain and, and walk around, you'll eventually bump into Sloan Square, and Sloan Square, you know, is named after Hans Sloan, who was the founder of the British Museum. And it was Sloan who, I guess, in the 17th century was beavering around cataloging plants and animals and things. And, you know, in the same way, um, what's his name? Ashmole. How the library at Oxford, the Ashmolean, is named after another 17th century fellow who was busy cataloging things, although I think Ashmole collected manuscripts and so on. So collecting, cataloging, um, natural history, you know, this is very much aligned with Holmes, who was a great um, observer of what we like to call trifles, but of course, you know, natural science in a way, evidence and things. So this is part of uh, amusing yourself by cataloging the world is sort well, that, of a characteristic of people. Yeah, that that's just it. it it's I, I think we it's important for all of us to have some kind of hobby, some kind of outlet uh, through which we can either share with others, much like we do here, or uh, simply take some time in isolation and enjoy ourselves. And you know, the the, the thing there is, it, there's a, there's a bit of a, a dichotomy there. I think there's yes, you can immerse yourself in that kind of study and in, in whatever it is that. Uh, you're passionate about. But at the same time, being immersed in that kind of a bubble, um, being, being so isolated from the rest of society or from great swaths of society um, can build some, it can build misinformation. It can build gullibility in some cases, if you don't know exactly what to expect. That, that's a great example of uh, even Jabez Wilson, much like Nathan Garadev. He was busy running a shop. Right? He was there isolated in his shop day to day. And of course, customers would come in. But when someone came in with this fanciful tale that, uh, you know, he was he, he it, there was a lottery, basically, and Jabez Wilson was the winner. Well, of course, he'd be predisposed to want to believe that, the, you know, day after day, opening his shop and maybe selling a couple of things. Um, that kind of isolation can build um again, misinformation. And, and I think staying in touch with each other in this particular time as we are, and, and you can do it via video, you can do it via letter writing. I think there's going to be a whole swath of letter writing that comes back to us. And I do want to get to letter writing with respect to isolation, because that leads us directly into the red circle. Well, right. You think about Emilia Luca, who was shut up in Mrs. Warren's uh, boarding house there for personal safety, certainly. And the only way she had to communicate with Mrs. Warren was by writing a word down. Um, one at a time, she would, she would leave a word on her tray. Uh, so this is a woman who was isolated by, um, you know, she was physically isolated, but she was also isolated by virtue of the language. She spoke uh, only Italian or very poor English and, and was using words that she could find in the newspaper to help satisfy her wants. Mm. That's a great, it's a great example. You know, loneliness really was the common characteristic of life. Um, I recall years ago living in a little town, getting to know my neighbors who were older, much older and realized in conversation with them that they had never been, um, anywhere beyond sort of a 50 mile radius of where they lived. And it's not everybody who's like Shakespeare, you know, and who goes from Stratford to London. There are people who um, just keep in their own particular orbit. But thankfully, all that is gone now that we have the internet, Facebook and social media. And here we are. Well, yes. let's use this opportunity to take a quick word from our sponsor. And when we come back, We'll get to some of your comments and questions that we see popping up in our Facebook page. So stay tuned. It is always a pleasure to receive the Baker Street Journal in the mail. It comes not four, but five times a year. Your 
four seasonal quarterlies plus the Christmas annual. And each time it is a welcome sight. That envelope arriving, tearing it open, seeing the yellow backed cover and the cover art in recent years has been changing each time. The publishers are keeping us on our toes. And of course, the content inside is no less exciting. You don't get too much on repeat with the Baker Street Journal, although you will see responses to various articles by other authors. But it is a lovely way to stay in touch with the Sherlockian world and to understand the things that are on people's minds and the things that are worth discussing. Check it out at BakerStreetIrregulars.com and make sure you subscribe today. Okay, always nice to hear from our friends at the Baker Street Journal. We are back and we are ready to discuss some of your comments and questions. They have been flowing in, so I do appreciate that. Um, we've got folks who are introverts and extroverts, and I think this very rightly kind of shows the divide with how people decide to handle their individual situations, whether they're in the canon or not. Um, but another woman who comes up who was very lonely, and I lost who mentioned this to us, is Eugenia Ronder. This, of course, comes to us from The Veiled Lodger, uh, one of the later cases, but it's probably the ultimate story in loneliness. This is a woman who self-isolated after uh, she was horribly uh, injured and disfigured by a circus accident. We won't give too much away. And Holmes went to talk with her. And in some ways, her her case was not necessarily the solving of a mystery, although it was uh, determining who she was and why she was veiled. That was uh, what we were after in that story. In as much as it was a confessional of sorts. You know, we've, we've talked about this on a number of shows before that so many of the characters in the canon are tragic figures. Uh, they have uh, incredibly sad stories uh, or uh, questionable endings. Uh, we don't know how life goes on after them. It's not always a happy ending. But for the reader's perspective, it makes great sense because it is, it's a definite conclusion to what we were looking for. And with Eugenia Ronder, here is a woman who decided to self-isolate after those many years and, in fact, was questioning her worth uh, on this earth. And uh, Holmes reminded her at the very end that her life is not her own and uh, that if she, if she were ever tempted to uh, take it, that she should approach him for assistance. Yeah, it's a very good example. Um, yeah, lonely. I mean, you know, there are so many negative I don't know how many, well, I guess there are a great number of tragic figures in the canon. That's true. We have talked about that. But loneliness, you know, has a profoundly negative set of characteristics. I think of Violet Hunter, um, you know, who goes back to her flat after this poor interview at Westaways and sees the bills that are due and realizes that she's sort of at the end of her tether. So, um, yeah, that is... And these sorts of desperate moments do characterize lots of people who have worked themselves into nervous apoplexy or other things, you know, before they consult Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, and I lost uh, uh, apologies. I, I lost who exactly said this because the comments are, they're getting squished down here for me, but uh, someone mentioned that Holmes himself was isolated or nearly isolated for three years during the great hiatus. You know, he, he immediately fled after the uh, interaction with Professor Moriarty at the Reichenbach Falls. Uh, a week later, he found himself in Florence and uh, over the next three years, he went all the way to Tibet and then uh, through Mecca and eventually back through France and made his way to London. So in doing so, he could not have had companionship uh, of any meaningful sort, uh, even though he may have spent time with the, uh, the Lama 1L, not 2, remember that, um, he, he was traveling alone and had to maintain his, uh, his, his uh, disguise 
Of course, he was known as Sigerson during the time, mm. uh, rather than really give away his secret to many, many folks. Yep. Yeah, that was Bob Katz, who I think, um, I'm not really seeing all of the comments coming in, but I did see, um, you know, this one from Bob Katz, who pointed out that Lindsay, our friend Lindsay Fay, wrote about this in um, her essay in the, um, in the manuscript series. Yeah, I'm, I'm just oh. grabbing it off the shelf right now. Uh-huh. Folks watching live can see me. You, you can't see this if you're you're on video. Uh, I just grabbed Out of the Abyss from our friends at the BSI Press. Oh. Um, not our advertiser this time around, but they do make their way to us uh, from time to time. And um, Lindsay Fay wrote an essay called The Empty, oh, excuse me, An Empty House hmm. on page 157 here. Uh, it's been a while since I've read this. And Bob, thank you for bringing that back to our attention. Um, and, and the way Lindsay wrote this uh, was as an excerpt from the diary of Dr. Watson in early 1894. And again, you know, Watson himself mentions when Holmes comes back that he was suffering from his own great bereavement. And we're meant to infer that that means uh, the loss of his wife. Uh, who, of course, would have been Mary Morstan at the time, Mary Morstan Watson. Mm. So Watson himself would have been enduring a certain kind of loneliness and isolation, having gone from having a, uh, a, a fairly steady uh, roommate slash companion uh, from 1881 on, uh, and then, of course, leaving homes for... Uh, for marriage, and then losing his next companion. So, um, of course, we can understand that Watson, uh, who himself was lonely when he got back from India uh, in A Study in Scarlet, uh, of course, looking for companionship at that point. So I, I think, uh, you know, you, we started by mentioning the loneliness of Sherlock Holmes, but Watson himself was not a stranger to isolation and loneliness. Yes, absolutely. And there are, you know, it's, it's now that I think about this, you know, you really find it's difficult to open up the canon and look at a character that doesn't have some connection to loneliness and isolation. And I was, so I just opened up a book and what did I see? I saw the five orange pips. Mm. So there you've got a bunch of open jaws who are, uh, let's put it this way. Their lives are disrupted when they get, envelopes of orange pips because they're being pursued. And then, you know, of course, you've got the Sholtos and the people who've committed crimes and who are worried about discovery. And, uh, you know, there are very few people who, in the canon, who've created a new identity for themselves who don't later on have some difficulty about it. Mm. Yeah. I uh, want to turn to a couple of medical cases or one medical case and one uh, well, I, I guess we could we could call it a medical case because it's uh, probably more psychological in nature um, of of isolation and quarantine. Mary Alcaro mentions poor Godfrey Emsworth, uh, who, of course, was uh, in the Blanched Soldier, mm. uh, only in quarantine. Right. That was an actual quarantine in the canon. Uh, you know, we, we mentioned infectious diseases uh, a few episodes ago. Well, this is uh, right in line with that. And Claire Thomas mentions the resident patient who she thinks is was lonely with only his paranoia and money for company. Uh, I think that's another great one. You know, can you imagine uh, living, what was it, 20 years beyond your crime uh, and not being able to share with anyone exactly who you were or uh, why you were afraid? And of course, that's exactly why he invited Dr. Percy Trevelyan to join him as his resident physician, as he himself was the resident patient. Mm. Yeah, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I'm sure we could go on and on, and maybe we should make this some kind of a regular thing here on Trifles, uh, notwithstanding all of our technical challenges. What we're going to do now is we're going to close the official show that will go into the recording can, but we'll remain here on video to continue to chat with you guys and take some uh, questions and feedback. So uh, if anything, this has not been 
a trifle. That is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You take my breath away, Mr. Holmes. Okay, and then you will have to tune in to our official show uh, to hear exactly which Granada clip we choose to close with. There's a different clip every week, and uh, it's our little Easter egg, our little surprise to you from time to time. So uh, that is the official end of the recorded version, and uh, we'll keep chatting here because we've got lots of comments to get to, and I, I do want to get over to YouTube as well. So. Um, at Jim, you had your question, can this be saved? Yes, it will automatically archive into uh, a recorded video, which you can pick up on the IHO's uh, Facebook page or on our YouTube channel at any time. Um, and just skip past the first few minutes of where we're trying to get ourselves in order here. Uh, <laughs> and that should handle everything. Um, and Bert, if you want to scroll through the comments there and answer more questions while I find our YouTube channel to see if folks are huh. lined up there, we can do that. Oh, yeah. Hey, what nice, um, nice comments from people. I wasn't seeing them. Oh, uh, but so many lovely ones like my feed is freezing up. I like that. <laughs> uh, you know, during that cold snap in London, when Holmes and Watson were stuck in the house, I think Watson said something similar about something freezing up. Maybe it was his toes. Um, but we, boy, what a no bunch of um, good comments here. Homeschooling. Now, see, that's something I never thought about. We don't have any. Well, of course, we have in the Copper Beaches, Violet Hunter, who has to care for that um, objectionable child um, for a while. But we don't have. Well, of course, we do, too. In. Um, um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um uh objectionable uh, child uh, uh yeah thanks yeah. yeah yeah governesses and things like that yeah um homeschooling that is interesting um can bert turn up the volume yeah, we got that already yeah. sorry <laughs> about that Really, this was a good idea. <laughs> well, it was a lot of fun. And, and uh, I feel we've got people who are following along there and, uh, and, and posting. I see Rob Nunn posted a selfie with uh, us on the, the laptop in the background. That was awesome. And I yeah. love the, the, the pink headphones, uh, Rob. It's a good touch. <laughs> Lady uh, Francis. Now, here's a lovely comment. I thought about that from Sandy. Ooh about Lady Frances Carfax, you know, and there is that wonderful line where Holmes is so eloquent. Of course, we know Conan Doyle had sisters who were governesses. Well, he clearly thought a lot about it, but we've got that wonderful line where he describes people who are moving from pension to pension, you know, women at large and like chickens in a, in a sea of foxes and things like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's a, that's another great one. Um, you know, I had a, a couple of others listed here, uh, or one other. Um, Beryl Stapleton, you know, we don't, it's not necessarily uh, referenced directly in the canon, but you can imagine uh, that uh, someone in such a lonely and isolated place, and Watson did mention, uh, did mention Dartmoor when it came to loneliness. Uh, that was the other mention in the canon. He said, um, uh, the sun was already sinking when I reached the summit of the hill, and the long slopes behind me were all golden green on one side and gray shadow on the other. A haze lay, lay low upon the farthest skyline, out of which jutted the fantastic shapes of Belliver and Vixen Tor. Over the wide expanse there was no sound and no movement. One great gray bird, a gull or curlew, so soared aloft in the blue heaven. 
he and I seem to be the only living things between a huge arch of the sky and the desert beneath it. The barren scene, the sense of loneliness, and the mystery and urgency of my task all struck a chill into my heart. And you can imagine that living in such an environment as Beryl Stapleton did, again, someone who was isolated by virtue of necessity, uh, and, and whose husband uh, slash brother took great pains to keep her from the rest of society and certainly uh, was disturbed when she and Henry began to take up together. Uh, you can imagine the, the extreme sense of boredom, loneliness, and terror that went through her own mind. Mm. Yeah, it's a very good example. Very good example. I'm also, um, you know, struck by one of Corey Howell's remarks about the exchange between Holmes and Watson at the end of Sign of Four, where, um, you know, Watson says to him, well, you know, you look weary. And Holmes says, yeah, I'm going to be as limp as a rag for a week. And then Watson says, you know, this, this is a poor division of labor. I get a wife out of it and this, that, and the other thing. And then the last line is, you know, for me, there is always the co cocaine bottle. And then he reaches up his long white hand. You know, that's sort of. That's amazing. Yeah. That's, that's, that's sad. Um, some other recent comments that came in here um, and related to the Hound of the Baskervilles. Bob Katz says he always thought of Laura Lyons as a desperately lonely person. Yeah. Again, someone who uh, had a, a failing marriage, who was seeking. Uh, maybe friendship, some kind of solace with Sir Charles. And, um, you know, when, when Holmes uh, and Watson were able to track her, they, I think they got a sense of that, that loneliness as well. Hmm. Yes. Claire, Claire Thomas mentions in uh, the Copper Beaches on the train, doesn't Holmes call the farmsteads lonely little dwellings? Well, oh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly right. Holmes mentions uh, seeing or at least being able to believe that there's more evil in these isolated places than there even is in the city, because people can get away with more things due to that sense of isolation. Mm. Yeah, and then Bob Katz observed, he always thought of Laurel. Did we talk about this? Always yeah, thought I just, about... I just said that. He just mentioned you Laurel. Multitasking again, Bert? No, no, I'm just not paying any attention. <laughs> I find these shows go a lot better if I don't pay attention. I know. Well, like most of our listeners, that's good. Yeah. I'm glad you're in league with them. This yeah, is yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But see, I did pay enough attention to knew it sounded to know it, it sounds sounded familiar. familiar. That's, that's yeah. amazing. Um, Steve Mason just said, "How about John Ferrier in Oh right in Scarlet? Yeah, I mean that's the ultimate uh, isolation. Yeah, everyone's been killed by disease, starvation, or uh, you know vulture." And it's just he and little Lucy at that point. And, and the, the, each of them, uh, both Lucy and John Ferrier, uh, were probably dealing with their own uh, bouts of loneliness in the uh, you know, day or days or so that led up to them meeting each other. Hmm. Well, you know, loneliness is not, uh, sometimes loneliness is not all it's cracked up to be. You know, we've mentioned Godfrey Emsworth a couple of times. And every time I see the name Godfrey Emsworth, I always think of Lord Emsworth, who is one of P.G. Woodhouse's characters in Blandings, who has a lot, except for his sister, has a lovely life, a pig, books, regular whiskey deliveries, is having a great time in the country. That sounds like something we should all be doing right about now. Yeah. You say to Lord Emsworth, you know, we, you've got to go to London, my lord. He says, London, my God, why would I want to do that? Why would I want to leave my home? And that's the great thing about being a Sherlockian. Um, well, I guess, or could be, at least somebody who's surrounded by lots of books. Uh, there's no shortage of things for us to do. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I, I love seeing uh, the books behind you as I love showcasing my own here. You know, perhaps we will do a uh, another episode, not a recorded episode, and maybe it's, uh, again, not not branded with trifles, but could be I hear of Sherlock everywhere in general, where we do a show and tell, you know, bring your your favorite item. And, and perhaps we can even use some other kind of technology, uh, whether it's Zoom or, or something else to invite people in and uh, show off their own 
books, collections, etc. It could be a, a lot of fun. Yeah. We'd love to hear yeah. some feedback. You know, if uh, if folks want to leave uh, some feedback here in the comment section, feel free to do that. Or if you'd like to leave us a comment, just uh, email us at comment at IHearOfSherlock.com. Yeah. Excellent. That is great. Um, let me, oh, will you look here? <laughs> Where? There, there is a special comments button right here in our interface on StreamYard where we can, <laughs> where we can see all this stuff from both platforms. Oh boy. Oh, really? Oh yeah. yes. Well, I'm seeing, yeah, I'm seeing it. This? Yeah. <laughs> I'm seeing it on the live comment stream from StreamYard, which is yeah. pretty good. Yeah. This is great. You know, here's an interesting comment Ruben Marsden had too about Robert Downey's Sherlock Holmes, that he's very lonely. Mm. Um, yeah, but deservedly so, because Robert Downey's Sherlock Holmes is particularly odd, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Eric Deckers, I don't want to let this comment uh, go without, uh, without mention, but uh, he said, I never knew Bert had a mustache. Yeah. Me neither. Anyone else think Scott should grow a mustache? Nope, no one. <laughs> no one does. <laughs> no, I should have put a bow tie on, though. Next time, I'll put one of my Sherlockian bow ties yeah, on. Yeah, we, we'll do a rotation. This this is the Holmes bow tie, if I if I may. Hmm. Uh, there we can see that. This is from our friends at Bow Ties Limited of Vermont. Hmm. You get in front of the camera. And they will eventually be marketing that, I think. Yes, they will. Yes, they will. God bless them. Indeed. A lot of fun for all kinds of folks. Here we are. Um, new comments. New comments. Sorry. Uh, and apologies okay. if we haven't gotten to everyone. So, uh, Jennifer, good to see you. Uh, Claire, glad you were with us. Ruben, extrovert that you are, I'm glad we could kind of fill that void. Bob asks, how are Sherlockians coping with uh, this isolation? Uh, well, I, Bob, that's a, that's a great question. I think this is one way that we're helping to cope with that. Um, the the springtime has naturally been a time when a lot of Sherlockian uh, societies come out of hibernation, and uh, many of them, if not all of them, have had to cancel their spring events, um, either proactively or uh, retroactively or, or reactively to what's going on. And I thought, well, maybe we can do something with regularity here that allows people to recreate a sense of what goes on at some of those. Perhaps we can have uh, some regular talks and papers that are given. Pre my preference is a talk uh, where someone can speak authoritatively on a subject rather than sit here and read to you. Um, of course, if you're a very good reader and it doesn't sound like you're reading, that might also be uh, something worth pursuing as well. But uh, the idea of having a virtual Sherlockian scion meeting uh, to me, sounded like one way that we could help deal with some of this isolation. So stay tuned mm. on that. Mm. Yes, I like that. Um, Steve Mason responded. Uh, he says, Bob, I'm reworking my collection of autographs. Uh, if you've never seen Steve Mason's collection of Sherlockian autographs, it's it's actors who have portrayed um uh, I don't think it's just Holmes. I think it may be Holmes and Watson as well. And Steve, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, but maybe we can get you to send in some photographs, Steve, and we can do a blog post on IHearOfSherlock.com uh, where we can showcase your collection and share it with people. I think that would be a wonderful way to uh, to get the word out there and for other people to share some of your joy. Yeah. Virtual, yeah, and we get a lot of good feedback. Thank you, Bob, about virtual Scion meetings you know it's awful thing to, have, to be looking forward to meetings of the sons of the copper beaches and the speckled band and others and and um you know find that that's not part of the year anymore and ash wednesday and things like that so mm. filling filling that void would be a good thing yeah over on youtube chris cross asks would you say that paul Cretitus from the greek interpreter was isolated even huh. though he was among his kidnappers 
Absolutely. I think that's another example, just like Emilia Luca, where he didn't yeah. even speak the language. Uh, he, they needed an interpreter to get through to him. So, of course, he was physically isolated in, um, oh gosh, the Myrtles. That was the name of the house. And he was, uh, you know, isolated by virtue of language. Hmm. Lots of isolation. Lots of isolation. Absolutely. Howard uh, Ostrom, or o Ostrom, uh, apologies, Howard, uh, makes the point that uh, Selden was uh, one of the most isolated figures, having escaped from Dartmoor uh, and then wandering out there on the moor. Only his sister could provide him uh, with uh, food and clothing. And I don't think she even, well, we don't know whether she did that in person or left it in a bundle somewhere for him to come pick up. No, and Patrick Ewing comments about the hound. Now, there's, there is a character who's definitely isolated. That's a great point. Uh, yes, and then there's Carlo the Mastiff in the Copper Beaches. He was, uh, he was pretty isolated and got. Yeah, really the funny thing is, I saw somebody uh, share this somewhere. They said, "Imagine all of the dogs at home right now getting so much more love and attention because we're home with them." Uh, working from home or, or schooling from home. Um, I think dogs, like horses, uh, as Holmes mentions in Silver Blaze, are gregarious creatures, and they thrive on that contact with, uh, with humans. And so imagine how the hound and Carlo must have gotten worked up the way they did <laughs> to attack when they finally did see a human, not only out of hunger, but just out of, uh, j just out of uh, personality at that point. Mm. Uh, dogs, I think, are, are very puzzled by the human habit of sitting still in one place for a very long time, staring at an uh, illuminated screen. I think dogs can't figure out what's going no, on. No, they, they can't. You know, George Carlin, uh, years ago, in one of his stand-up routines, said, uh, what do dogs do on their day off? They can't lie around. That's their job. <laughs> so... Now, there's an interesting point by Eric, who mentions, by the way, that his his father uh, got a bow tie based on our bow tie episode. So thank oh, you. Good. I'm glad. One sale. That's good. One sale. <laughs> he says, Mrs. Hudson must have been constantly alone other than greeting Holmes as visitors. Well, what do we know about that? Um, there, There is a story where uh, it's Mrs. Turner, not Mrs. Hudson. That was, of course, a scandal in Bohemia. Uh, was uh, doing uh, some of the helping. The speculation is that Mrs. Hudson was gone visiting somewhere, uh, but the rest of the time she had to provide, I don't know if it was three square meals a day or at least one to Holmes and Watson. So she very much had to be on the premises, but we don't know anything about her personal life, do we? No, we don't even know if there was a um, Mr. Hudson, although I like to believe that her estranged husband was Morse Hudson. And that that's just a detail Watson didn't bother us with. You know, just as an aside, uh, speaking of Morse Hudson, um, one of my favorite scenes in the Granada Sherlock Holmes is in The Six Napoleons when Lestrade visits Baker Street and mentions something about, oh no, Watson mentions something about Red Republicans. And Lestrade goes, oh, you've been talking to Morse Hudson. <laughs> and Brett immediately jumps in. Holmes jumps in with, oh, do go on, Lestrade. Son of a respectable Italian tradesman, but involved with a secret political society. Red anarchists. Oh, you've been talking to Morse Hudson, haven't you? Do go on, Lestrade. <laughs> I, just, I love that little exchange there. <laughs> I didn't know Morse Hudson was a senator from Vermont. That's amazing. Oh, Red Republic. <laughs> got it. I, uh, 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 a while there, Bernie. I'm not uh, a Bernie uh, bro. What can I say? Uh, uh. Ah, well, thank you all. I think we, we, Bert and I have been on for about an hour. Uh, you, many of you have been with us uh, since we finally went live, I think at about quarter past the hour. So thank you. Only an hour, huh? Um, let's, I know, right? Let's do this again. This was a lot of fun. And uh, thank you for your feedback. Keep the feedback coming, either in comments here or shoot us an email at comment at iheroofsherlock.com. 
Uh, make sure your friends and all Sherlockians you know are subscribed to us. Get those email updates when we send them out. Um, like our page, subscribe to our YouTube channel, whatever works for you. Um, it was delightful to see 50 or so of you at a time in here, keeping that number consistent throughout. Um, until next time, I'm Scott Monty. And I'm unfortunately still Burt Wolder. And together we say, The Games of Foot. <laughs> <laughs>